been working on like four different presentations and this is kind of a, a, a combination of all four of those for four different groups uh, to put this together. So um, you can go ahead to the next slide. Um, I'm Desiree Wood. I'm the founder and president of Real Women in Trucking. And uh, it was formed by working women drivers to address sexual assault and harassment in truck driver training. Our other organization is Truckers Emergency Assistance Responders, and we help drivers that get stranded on the road. It's sort of a practice in this industry that you have a, a, a disagreement with your driver. They will just evict you from the truck where you're standing and not give you your last paycheck or resources to get home. So that's kind of um, what we have stepped in to help with. Um, I'm on some freight advisory um, committees um, in Florida is one, and some of our members are in different states, um, including this um, committee. And some of the projects I'm working on right now are um, this guidebook for local truck parking regulations and uh, freight relay, which is to study um, um, hubs where trucks would go 250 miles out and then 250 miles back, letting the driver go home rather than having to be long haul in an effort to make it a more attractive job for somebody that cannot be over the road. You can go to the next slide. So I, I always like people to know that truck drivers are a lot more diverse than you might see in the industry. Um, women have been truck drivers since trucks were first developed around 1918. They just haven't really been visible. Um, some of the ladies that you see in the screen have been driving over 50 years, nearly 55 years, and they're still driving. Um, they, ha they haul um, everything from food to high security, money, uh, pharmaceuticals, um, construction materials. There's also a rather large LGBTQIA community in trucking. And um, NPR uh, Kentucky just covered one that you could um, look up on the internet if you're interested in knowing more about that. Next slide, please. Sorry, I'm just trying to move out. Oh, sorry. This is okay. the next slide. So uh, a lot of times uh, people don't really, they have a hard time connecting. Like uh, everybody hears, you know, trucking moves America forward or trucks bring everything. And, and they really do. If a produce, I mean, everybody should be able to relate to trucks. Um, I know all of you do, but the, the average person doesn't really understand that their banana and the pen and the laptop and the everything uh, that they buy and the clothes on their back come on a truck. So whether it's coming from the port or whether it's coming from, um, you know, uh, where they make cigarettes for those people to still smoke uh, over in the Carolinas, uh, it's loaded on the truck and it could take a couple days to get there. It could take one day or it could take the entire week to get there. Some of this stuff is really high um, value it is um, risky to haul it for us. So there's a lot of pressure put on truck drivers to be safe. Um, some of this high security, they say drive 250 miles without stopping just in case of being hijacked. I have actually been high, had my trailer hijacked myself. Um, it's not just electronics that are risky, but food because food has a very quick uh, resale value on the street. So when we're talking about making a resilient supply chain um, and then you think about the truck parking, it's always been sort of puzzling for me that when I go pick up a load of electronics like flat screen TVs or something that's expensive, I actually have to get inside the trailer and have my picture taken with that freight so that if something happens to it, I'm the one responsible for it. Yet I'm put out on the road and I'm to fend for myself um, parking along the way across the nation. So um, this is something that, um, you know, we would not send our service members overseas to defend our country and then say, by the way, get a motel and you have to pay for it. So there, that's kind of the disconnect with the truck parking situation that um, it's all, the onus is on the driver. Um, most of them are not reimbursed for paid truck parking. So the rise of this reservation system uh, doesn't make uh, sense for um, a lot of them. 
uh, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. So uh, we um, do have our appointments dictated by the shippers and receivers. A lot of people say, well, if you planned your trip better, but trucking is a 24 seven um, industry, but warehousing is a nine to five Monday through Friday. So when the ELD mandate was implemented, it sort of forced all the truck drivers on the road at the same time, because once the clock starts on that electronic device, you gotta go and you can't say, well, there's a lot of traffic right now. So what I'm gonna do is get my load. I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, take a nap and drive when all the commuters are done driving and then get on the road, or I'm gonna drive tonight or something. So once this thing starts, everybody's forced to be on the road at the same time and everybody's forced to start looking for parking at the same time. So this has made the truck parking issue harder since this ELD mandate has been put into effect. Um, uh, go ahead. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, I see. So I'm, I'm sure most of you know that we have hours of service. We're allowed to drive 11 hours within 14 hours and then we have to stop for 10 hours. Um, so when these uh, shippers and receivers use the just-in-time ordering system, a lot of times the burden is also on the truck driver to be like a mobile storage unit. Uh, they, you get there and their facility is not big enough for them to take the product out of the trailer or they don't, haven't been able to move things around on their floor um, to get the product to you. So you have to some find a place to stage uh, there are places that will fine you for being early. Uh, you will be fined for being late. So you have to be very um, on, much on time, which is rather hard to plan for when you're going across the entire country because so many things can happen. In addition to that, uh, a lot of these places will not let you use the bathroom. And so the, 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 basic human needs that you need to live on the road, you're deprived of also when you're seeking this truck parking. Um, this book uh, recently came out, or it's been, I think it's been out for a little time, and I, I encourage you um, all to um, check it out, Data Driven. And uh, she talks a lot about the ELD mandate, but in my firsthand experiences with these two organizations, uh, there is a growing uh, problem of companies who have found a way to manipulate the ELD to uh, use drivers that are inexperienced or are not really hireable other places to take these jobs where they tell them you drive your 11 hours and then pull over on the side of the road and call a number and uh, we will give you more hours. So what they're doing is they are seating a driver that does not exist on the truck, on the ELD. So the, the, the data says there's two drivers on that truck, but there's actually just one. And then that driver continues to drive. Um, so what, what they're doing is they're cheating the system, a system that was put in place to eliminate double log books um, and somebody driving unsafe on the right, um, on the highway. Uh, so you have drivers out there that are driving 16, 17 hours day after day, but there's really not any enforcement. There's not anybody really looking at this in a meaningful way. Um, you can go on to the next slide. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the other things that I wanted to touch on was the driver compensation. Um, uh, I've, I've seen some uh, mentions there's going to be driver compensation studies, but you, you can't study truck driver compensation unless you look at truck drivers under three years of experience who are employee drivers, who are entry level student drivers, because that is where there is a lot of over recruiting. Um, they get a lot of the companies get a lot of tax incentives. Uh, to hire these drivers, but around the four or five month mark, they lose interest in them, so they leave and many fall through the cracks. They are a cheap labor source and they need to be tracked to just see how much, because you have drivers out there working, even if they're doing legal on the logbook, 
with one driver, they're working 70 hours a week on the ELD, but they're working another 20 off the ELD from the detention time that's not paid. And that's not counting the ghost drivers I just spoke about. So this is an average home time policy for truck drivers. And you can see that the company is advertising that they think they're actually helping the driver. They're really, a, um, they understand family and they're giving them one day off for every, every seven days on the road. So in order for you to even be eligible to go home, you have to stay on the road for a minimum of three weeks at most of these companies. And often they will send you on a load in the opposite direction when you have scheduled that time on. Uh, time off. Uh, these drivers are paid by the mile. And so um, all of this uh, free work time starts to add up. Okay, and you can go on to the next one. So I mentioned student fleets. Um, these are very big companies. Uh, they do a lot of um, over recruiting, uh, but there's not a lot of accurate studies on them. There's not a lot of research data because they're self-insured. So when they're self-insured, we don't really know what is their true safety record because they're really the one that's in charge of telling us that. Um, uh, the new students go to these companies believing they will get one-on-one -on -one training with their trainer, but they're actually required to live together in an unsupervised uh, tractor trailer for up to 45 days. One is driving and the other one is sleeping, except um, you know, in between loads, the, the trucks have bunk beds, so they're changing clothes in there. Uh, they might have to be going to the bathroom in there in a portable toilet. Um, there is an award-winning investigative report from the Center of Public Integrity called Attacked Behind the Wheel. If you want to know more about this, it is on YouTube and it's on my LinkedIn. Um, by the way, uh, team drivers still need truck parking. I hear that a lot at some meetings uh, that team drivers don't need truck parking. That's not true because in between loads, you could be waiting uh, 24, 34 hours for a load to come up. And you are now two people in this really small space trying to get all of these services. Um, next slide. Um, moving on to the autonomous truck. Um, uh, in my experience, and we have a couple members that are safety drivers of these autonomous trucks. And what they've said to me is that they would never leave these trucks unattended ever. Um, so uh, we've also heard that the autonomous truck will be the new team driver and it will eliminate the risks that I spoke about um, earlier. The, the, the human driver, you have to have a lot of trust to have uh, somebody driving while you're sleeping. And when you think about our infrastructure, even when you have a, a team driver that's a great driver, you're going over bumps on the road, you're going over um, rumble strips where they're doing road construction. There's, uh, you can literally feel when you cross the state line in some areas like going into Louisiana, just the bumps in the road and the potholes and the drop-offs. So team driving is really not restful sleep. Um, I just wanted to add these couple pictures. This picture is of I think we lost you. Is there? Uh, sorry, yeah, I think I accidentally. Sorry about that. So, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Not sure where I left off, but what I was saying is, you really have to trust your team truck your team driver. And with the way the infrastructure is, even if you trust your team driver, you're going feeling like you're sleeping on a buckboard a lot of times on some of the roadways with the construction zones and the rumble strip has moved. And there's just all kinds of reasons why you're not gonna get a good night's sleep. I put these pictures of Paul Fernandez in, the, in this PowerPoint because he was a team truck driver um, his team partner tried to beat the train and he was killed. 
Um, Paul would have been my grandfather if he would have lived. He died when my mother was five years old, leaving my grandmother, um, you know, with no uh, husband in the 1940s and four little children under five. The judgment that he calls that you have to make every single moment as a truck driver are so important. So these trucks, we don't know enough at this time, like what do they do in torrential rain and fog and ice and snow? We see them being tested on very straight roadways that are, in our opinion, like the perfect scenario, but they don't reflect what we do on a day-to-day -day business. Um, you know, so piloted autonomous for a plane in a boat is is open space, uh, unlike the highway that has lanes and and impediments and animals jumping out on the road. Um, we are trained to if a deer jumps out in front of us, uh, floor it because we can't swerve or we'll roll the truck. But what if it was a child? Do, do we floor it then? You know, how does the truck know this is a this is a deer, not a kid? So for us as truck drivers. These trucks um, present a number of concerns. Um, you can go to the next slide. But we also, uh, one, one more back. But we also, oh, I, I think I maybe got it. We also um, want to make sure people know the final mile is the hardest mile. Those are the days you pick up uh, and deliver. So you're not covering very many miles. You're doing a lot of turns, you're doing backing, you're opening doors, you're doing all the work that is really not paid uh, when you're getting paid by the mile. So what they're saying is we're gonna take away the fun part of the job, that open highway job, and we're gonna have you just do the, the part of the work that you don't get paid for that's kind of not the fun part of the job. So we really need to start thinking about modernizing wages and repealing the Fair Labor Standards Act so drivers are paid for all of their time and start looking at this, um, this work and how it's going to be compensated and have a more realistic approach, sort of like the freight relay model. Um, you can move on from there. And then lastly, I wanted to say um, I just concluded a bunch of interviews with truck drivers, but being one myself, we need to have solutions beyond just the truck stop. There are a lot of abandoned strip malls, uh, Greyhound, um, tracks in Florida, uh, shopping malls, and um, there should be revenue generation from services because truck drivers are consumers too. We have to eat every day. We have to hopefully take a shower. We need access to the bathroom. There shouldn't have to be a law <laughs> to tell people that we need to go to the bathroom a few times a day. Um, uh, we need to do our laundry. We would like to exercise and have some sort of a quality of life on the road. So there's a lot of vacant properties around that we see would be ideal for this if people would see us more as consumers, um, which ironically were the ones that bring things to the consumers. Uh, the other thing is parking permits for trade zones only. Um, get some of the RVs that are out um, on, in industrial street parking areas that are camped out there and make it for um, uh, commercial vehicles only. You can go down to the next slide. And then these are some of the ideas, laundry, food, mail services, um, gyms. Um, a lot of us travel with a dog. So, uh, so there's a, a, a number of different things that could revenue, uh, generate revenue from services for truck drivers that they need instead of thinking this, um, this is all going to be paid parking uh, because we, we want to spend our money in these communities if they would let us. You could go to the next um, slide. Um, our YouTube channel is called Women Truckers Network. Uh, many times I will make some of these uh, PowerPoints. Not This one's not on there. 
uh, yet, but a couple other ones that have some of these same slides are on there that you can replay, and they are anywhere from like 10 minutes to an hour if you want to know more. And if anybody has any questions for the last slide. Okay, uh, yeah, I can see some questions in the chat. Uh, Ricky is asking, uh, can we get a co copy of PowerPoint from 